Yeah, good morning. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, welcome to the January uh, FANG meeting from Orange County. Um, I think uh, there's some of you who are new, but we try to do an accounting update every January, kind of kick the year off uh, right. And we've been supported uh, for the last what, five or six years, I think, Don, by uh, Baker Tilly. So with that, Don, would you introduce our guest speakers, please? I'll do that. So we've got two speakers today. Uh, Andrew Valverde has over 12 years of public accounting experience and specializes in delivering audit and insurance services for privately and publicly held businesses in the real estate and manufacturing and distribution industries. Andrew manages and coordinates all aspects of financial statement audit and review engagements. Lori Hess is the tax director in our Irvine office. She has over 20 years of accounting experience specializing in C-Corps. Lori has experience serving in both public accounting as well as from private industry, having worked previously for Price Waterhouse Coopers, First American Financial, William Lyon Homes, Apria Healthcare, and Wiley Inc. She has an extensive experience serving both public and private companies with multi-state operations specialize in income tax, accounting, compliance, and tax consulting. With that, Andrew. Don, Dave, thank you for the introductions. Uh, look forward to doing this one every year for you guys. Thanks for having us. Uh, more than happy to do that and, and catch up with you guys. It's been a really good experience. So hopefully we put together some um, good materials for you all today. Kind of approach this um, every time you reach out to me, Don, thinking about you know, the planning conversations we've been having with our audit clients over the last couple of months as we prepare for year end, um, you know, calendar year end, audit planning, um, business updates, what's relevant to companies in, in Orange County specifically and, and more broadly. And so put together some thoughts on on conversations that we've had with with our CFOs and controllers, what's relevant to them, and hopefully can share some of those insights and then would love to get some feedback from you all as well. I think that's one of the best parts about uh, this meeting is, you know, the the collective talent and and uh, experience from the group. So that'd be good. And then we've got some updates on recent accounting pronouncements the last couple of years. As you remember, we've GAP has rolled out revenue accounting, ASC 606 contracts, customers, leases last year. This year, the big ticket item is Cecil credit losses for financial instruments. So hoping to give you an update there on what to expect as you approach implementation if you haven't done so already. Um, some of the concepts and, and key requirements. And then from there, we'll transition into Lori Hess on the tax update. Uh, it's a little bit quiet this year after some uh, pretty uh, active years on the tax front, you know, starting with probably Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act up to last year, some of the R&D um, updates. But uh, nonetheless, there's always always things on the um, radar for tax and, and things to stay up to date on. So Lori will provide that update a little bit later on. Um, and so with that, we'll kind of jump into it and feel free to stop at any point. I'd love to get feedback from the group. Don't bother interrupting me. Um, more than happy to backtrack if needed. So with that, let me share my screen, and then we can go from there. Can everybody hear me and see me okay in the presentation as well that's now on the screen? Yes. Excellent. All right. So client planning discussions, what, what have we been hearing? Um, and kind of some of the trends and, and how that might impact financial reporting. So I think one of the key areas we've discussed over the last two years is going back to the post-COVID supply chain disruption, how that impacted uh, the supply chain inventory levels, sales, and kind of the related accounting effects. So I thought it would be interesting to get an update there. From what we've seen last year, we're record low inventories from our clients. Um, 
the supply chain started to correct about this time last year. And, and a lot of clients are reporting that their inventory levels are getting back to more normal stock. And so that's had an effect on their selling habits as well, how much they're willing to discount and incentivize to get product through the channel and, and monetized. So seeing a lot more of that, and it's interesting kind of seeing the inflation data too, because with that um, normal level of inventory and product, again, more competitive pricing, meaning costs are kind of correcting back. Um, that's what we've seen and what we've been hearing from our clients. So if you remember going back, you know, 24 months from now, we had container prices at, you know, approaching $11,000 per container from the normal, you know, 500 to 1,000 level. That's the green line uh, last year and the purple one, you know, the last year has been very consistently low as you've, you've all probably noticed. So um, getting that benefit of that cost back to the business and, um, you know, decreased inventory cost hopefully leads to um, better margins and better performance overall. I think that we've seen that. As far as inflation, everybody's kind of been keeping track of that, of course. It's been eased through the year. The effect on, on our clients' businesses have been mixed. Um, some of them have kind of been able to benefit from getting their margins up and, and their bottom line up. Others have still continued to struggle with that. So a little bit of mixed results. As far as how that looks um, in the CPI, we kind of hold this, this graph here, kind of going back a couple of years, obviously at the beginning of that, um, the COVID pandemic. and just noticing that that consistently high level of inflation all through 2022 and then 2023 you know that drop off um pretty nice up up to this point so i'm sure you've all been experiencing that and hopefully um has benefited the businesses uh, that y'all are managing as far as retail sales you know, it's kind of uh, interesting to see through how that's affected businesses. You see that nominal um, sales, the blue line up top right. Um, and then when it's adjusted for inflation, you can see it's been it's been slowly trending up. Um, so the numbers, you know, are kind of interesting to see what the actual effect is after controlling for inflation. But the good thing is it's it's trending positively and in particular, 2023, um, starting to peak back up again, which is nice. Back on the consumer side, on the business side, this is durable goods reported by the U.S. Census Bureau. So you can see really choppy growth pattern throughout 2023 here. Um, I think that reflects a lot of our clients, you know, being cautious. We've been talking about, you know, potential recession over the last couple of years, a soft landing, a hard landing. Nobody really has that much certainty about how things are going to pan out in the next you know year plus. So still seeing a lot of conservatism in the more, you know, uh, investment heavy purchases. Um, so that kind of the other other side of the coin here with what we've been seeing with our clients. And if you all haven't um, participated in watching the Chapman economic forecast, I'd highly recommend it. Starting about two years ago, um, they allowed for free viewing on um, YouTube, and it's available now. I think I, I left a link here, but if you just go to YouTube and search Chapman economic forecast, it's available for free for a long time. Uh, that was a paid um, in-person attendance to watch and, and you know, a lot of high profile figures from Orange County there. So, and, and more importantly, just the feedback that they provide is very insightful. It's one of the um, leading economic forecasts. But the reason that I mentioned that is to recommend you all to take a look at that. It's probably an hour or two. Um, but essentially the takeaways were um, Dodi, who's the lead economist for for the the school, kind of predicted uh, weak 
growth. So he, he stayed away from a recessionary uh, conclusion, which is what they kind of came away with last year. So that is a nice kind of indication of where uh, hopefully we see the economy going. You can see in the bottom uh, chart there, the 2023 actual GDP growth was 2.4%, and they're forecasting somewhere between 1% and 2% this year. So kind of a good sign um, from that indication. Again, one of the more accurate forecasts uh, nationally. And so <laughs> the other interesting takeaway is they, they put together this presidential um, forecast as well that's kind of tied to the economic metrics being um, inflation and job growth. And um, they've been spot on in predicting the uh, presidential election. So for better or for worse, what they concluded based on the current data inputs was that uh, the Democrats would would come away with, with the win based on the economic data. So that was an interesting part of, of that update. I recommend you guys all um, take a look at that when you have the time. It was very, very insightful. So based on the macro data, kind of what are the takeaways from our client planning meetings and potential effects. So again, seeing cautionary spending from business investment and payroll headcount. A lot of companies still kind of hesitating to to hire too aggressively, even though maybe they're a little bit short staffed. Budgeting for increased concessions and discounting, again, with normal inventory levels, kind of um, anticipation of, of an uncertain economy. I think we're seeing a lot of our clients budget more for um, discounts and incentivizing. So that would have an impact on the sales reserves, depending on, you know, your, uh, your, your product cycle, you know, how long your sales take to realize and to, you know, rebate spending, um, credit memo issuances, that type of activity would potentially have an impact on your sales reserves and the liabilities. And then, I think the biggest takeaway is is we've kind of feel like we know what the final effect of COVID nineteen was on the business. We kind of started twenty twenty, obviously had um, dramatic impacts on on the economy, on equity markets, on inflation, and for that twelve to twenty four month period through twenty twenty two, it was really a guessing game of of how that was all going to play out on businesses and. I think in our current planning meetings, it seems like we kind of have a feel for the long-term continued um, status of, of the business, for better or for worse. Um, we've unfortunately seen seen a couple of bankruptcies. We've seen, on the other hand, a couple of um, really strong growth patterns and and uh, positive trends as well. So it seems really... Um, based on on the industry really um so would, would be interested to see what you all have to say i mean with that i'll go into the accounting standards update but i thought it'd be a good point to just kind of open up to the group to see you know is there anybody that has any insights that that they'd be willing to share in terms of you know customer backlog is, is it growing is it is it shrinking kind of what are your businesses seeing and projecting for the next year. Anybody willing to uh, share some thoughts? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, I'm in the restaurant space, so we're actually a client of yours. Um, since, I'd say July, we've had a downtick in sales. So we've had, we increased prices in January of 23 by eight plus percent. We finally caught up with the food costs at that point. And our margins got restored to where they were really pre-COVID. Um, but the cumulative effect of inflation, you showed the graph where the rate's down. However, it's not negative, which means it's cumulative. Right. And we're a discretionary place. Uh, the most expensive item on our menu is 28 bucks, And we have locations that will be negative sales year over year in, in the face of an 8% plus price increase. Um you know, so I, I think the consumer, and I think a lot of restaurants are, are facing the same thing. The consumer is tapped out. 
or stressed out. And so uh, anybody playing in the discretionary spend space is going to feel it. Totally. I think one of the slides in the economic forecast um, that they focused on was the federal debt level and also the consumer debt level really starting to to perch back up at a high level. And so, yeah, totally makes sense on the consumer side of them spending through their pandemic savings is what they referred to it as. And, you know, maybe they're lo a little bit more loaded up with consumer debt and now spending. Well, I don't think the supply. Yeah, you know, I, I don't supply chains fixed. OK, I think there's still supply chain issues and the it's a cumulative impact of inflation. Right. So you had nine percent on three percent and the wages haven't kept up. So gasoline is still expensive. Eggs are through the roof. I mean, just, you know, think about it. The simplest meal you can make is scrambled eggs. Right. And it's uh, through the roof. So that's there. The other thing on the economic side, um, you realize the BLS has downgraded every jobs number in 2023 substantially so the job growth there you got to kind of wait to see what the final numbers are because it's not been as strong as originally advertised and that's mm -hmm. that's a whole nother equation too there's another Absolutely. item here with regard to uh, what i saw an uh, interview of the president at macy's i never thought of this before he says their stores have product that we sell with the understanding that there are certain income or spending levels by different groups of people. You have the one who has so much money, uh, there's never really a question of a large purchase. Those people are unaffected. They're still buying. Then if you only look at three tiers, the middle tier is the couple or a person who is slightly ahead every month who can maybe go in and, and buy one or two items, but if they try to buy three or four at a time, it may create a pinch, or they may be buying every other month rather than uh, every month, but they're still spending. And the last tier is the person who needs basic things just to do a basic life. They may have uh, to change their shoes because there's a hole in them or whatever the case may be. They may be employed or unemployed or whatever the case may be. And they're spent out. There's very little sales going on at that level. Uh, people have faced inflation and there's parts of the nation. I understand in Portland, Oregon, 17% increase effective January 1 in electrical utility costs passed on to the consumer. Well, if you're a senior citizen and you're dependent upon Social Security, your cost of living index is about 3.2%, far cry from 17. Certainly mm -hmm. 17 is only a far part of your disposable expenses. But uh, I think from what I've seen and what I've heard, there's it, it's just not in Orange County, it's across the whole United States, where there's this lower percentage, whichever percentage you want to attach to it, I think it changes uh, geographically, of the consumer might be working, but they're almost running negative. And in some cases, they are pulling from their savings to get the basic needs because they're running out of their paycheck before they run out of the month. Um, and going for the lowest cost items, oftentimes, which are a bare necessity. So I'd be curious if other people had any input more of a correction, I guess, to to that where it, during the post-pandemic period, 21, 22, there was a little bit more um, spending power there, right? With some of the incentives, the employer retention credits, um, um, you know, all that other stuff that led to a little bit more money in the pockets of the consumer kind of faded. Seems. Well, stimulus uh, in in this lower income spending group, uh, from my understanding, is virtually gone. So, but for others, they may or may not still have a little bit of it left, or they may have been in a positive savings, maybe not at ten percent, maybe at five percent, or whatever the case may be. Maybe they have the ability to work a little bit of overtime to kind of make it up, 
So that middle group still has a little bit of spending left. But um, I mean, recently took a road trip at Christmas instead of flying. Go buy a lot of car dealerships, and maybe not all of them, but a lot of them we saw packed, packed with cars unsold. And many of them appeared to be just not EV, but um, regular gasoline powered vehicles. And in times past, that trend continues, uh, their lots are full, and where do they put them? And where do the manufacturers put them? And the manufacturers try to do a lot of things to adjust inventory. They, for example, may be producing, uh, I'll pick on Ford a little bit, Mustangs or whatever, mm -hmm. shut down the plant every other week. Work a week, shut down a week. Work a week, shut down a week. Work a week, shut down a week. Mm -hmm. Some of the people off on employment. And in uh, UAW, there's some subpay where they try to bring up the worker to be full less the travel expenses and expenses of working at lunch and at the factory and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, and that's how they try to adjust. But it wasn't too long ago, I'm talking about maybe a couple of years back, when in the manufacturing of the automobile, they were missing critical parts, shortage of, uh, of uh, integrated circuits. Yeah. Uh, window doesn't go up, window doesn't go down. That's one of the more simpler ones. But the ones that went into the uh, uh, combustion system hey, and elsewhere. Hey, hey Rick, Rick, I think we need to move on. I think yeah, we need to I, move I just on see the these things all over the place. Yeah. We maybe have uh, one more um, uh, speaker to chime in on, on what they're seeing. I think we've got a few more minutes for that. All right. Well, good stuff. I always appreciate hearing from you guys. It's um, it's interesting. You know, I have a, a handful of clients, so I give you my takeaways, but uh, definitely some interesting feedback from you all as well. So appreciate that. Getting back to the slides here covering um, recent accounting standards updates. So private companies here. Thank you. There we go. We've got only two major ones. This isn't a comprehensive list, more just the standards that are gonna be more broadly applicable to most businesses. So the first is CECL. So we'll have a segment on that. I'll get into details about how that is gonna work for, for businesses. And the other is a disclosure item for liabilities for supplier finance programs. So I'll get into that here, just a, a brief overview. So for any businesses where you are purchasing from a supplier on terms that are financed by a third-party financing company, um, often referred to as reverse factoring, payables finance plans, or structured payable arrangements. Um, these are gonna be required to be disclosed in the financial statements. I think this is overdue. There was a lot of diversity in practice. We definitely encouraged our clients with these types of arrangements to disclose um, some aspects about these and, and the impact on their business, but it wasn't a gap requirement. Uh, this year going forward, it is a gap requirement and um, it aims to just eliminate that diversity in practice uh, across different entities. So some of the key disclosure items are going to be just a general description of the plan, the payment terms, and any assets pledged as security against those arrangements. Uh, the second, and the amount of any unpaid claims at your balance sheet date, including where it's classified in the balance sheet, as well as an annual roll forward of the activity from one uh, balance sheet date to the next, addition, subtractions, ending balance. You've seen um, those before. And then if there's multiple programs, you can aggregate those disclosures. If they're um, fairly similar, if they're substantially different, um, you are required to, to break those out uh, separately. So that is supplier finance programs. I'll save CECL for a little bit later. Um, coming up next year in your 2024 financials, technically the roll forward part of that liability uh, for supplier finance programs, the roll forward disclosure isn't required until next year, but most companies that are gonna adopt that are just gonna go ahead and early adopt the roll forward portion of that as well. Uh, a couple of other items for business combinations, joint venture formations, 
most companies aren't going to, you know, really be exposed to that. And then the other for business combinations, accounting for contract assets and liabilities. If you've attended this presentation in years past, we focused on revenue accounting. Um, and if you recall, based on the uh, revenue recognition and then the payment, um, where you're at with getting your payment from your customer, it'll create either a contract asset or a contract liability. There really wasn't any specific accounting rules for that uh, other than just the broadly applicable rules. Um, in 2024, next year, again, they will have uh, specific criteria for considering when you uh, merge or acquire a business, how to account for those contract assets and contract liabilities. Maybe we'll discuss that next year. And then I kind of wanted to just briefly discuss why we're talking about these things. So if you go back five plus years and really 10, plus, 10 years ago, there was the whole concept of convergence of accounting standards that there was a lack of comparability between U.S. GAAP and international financial reporting standards. And so there was an initiative to bring those closer into an alignment. And really, ultimately, the goal was to be converged into one global uh, accounting standard. But, you know, a lot of things have happened since then. And, and pretty much there's just always going to be differences between U.S. GAAP and international standards. But with AC 606 revenue accounting, we are much closer to be in line with lease accounting. And now with CECL, um, that covers a lot, a lot of areas of the financial statements. And so here's a list that I pulled from the CPA journal that kind of covered what is currently converged between US GAAP and IFRS. So it includes revenue, stock comp or share payments, segment reporting, fair value measurement, um, discontinued operations. And then the last one, financial instruments, that's the one that I'll talk about later with Cecil. Um, it was originally going to be converged, but now we have differences because there's new accounting standards that have been rolled out. So um, that's the list of fully adopted standards that are converged. Here's a list of others that are kind of substantially converged or partially converged um, over the years. Um, you can take a look at that if you'd like, but I thought it was kind of a, just an interesting thing to cover because that's why we're talking about CECL, right? Because of this initiative to converge US GAAP and international financial reporting standards. So let's talk about CECL. Uh, let me just check my clock here. All right, get some time. So here's, I'll just read this here for you guys. The methods used to recognize impairment losses on financial assets has been considered a deficiency in U.S. GAAP, in many cases causing delayed recognition of such losses. Accordingly, FASB issued ASU 2016-13 to amend its guidance on impairment of financial assets. The ASU established a credit loss impairment model referred to as the current expected credit loss model or CECL which is based on expected losses rather than incurred losses. We'll talk a little bit about that. The objectives are to, one, reduce the complexity in U.S. GAAP by decreasing the number of credit impairment models that entities use to account for debt instruments. As you know, legacy GAAP, you know, accounts receivable, you can kind of use judgment or, you know, an argument data that you've received from your customer on the likelihood of collection to report that AR at net realizable value. That's going out the window now. All financial assets, including accounts receivable, are subject to this credit loss model. Um, so the second item is to eliminate the barrier to timely recognition. So hopefully we're more recognizing those losses um, earlier and not later. The third, to require an entity to recognize an allowance of lifetime expected credit losses, um, not just uh, a reserve for current expected, but really what do you expect over the lifetime of that asset? And the fourth is to not require a specific method for entities to use. Um, but that's kind of a misnomer. I'll get into that a little bit. What is financial asset? A financial asset is cash, evidence of an ownership interest in an entity or a contract that conveys to, from one entity a right to 
do either of the following, either to receive cash for the financial instrument from the second entity, to exchange the other financial instruments on potentially favorable terms with the second entity, really anything that can be monetized, right? Um, prepaid expense really isn't a financial asset, right? Because that's not going to be converted into cash or a right to receive um, something. It's, it's more just a timing um, mechanism. Cash, accounts receivable, um, investments, uh, equity method investments, that type of thing. Uh, these are going to be financial assets that are subject to this new CECL model. All right. So a lot of people kind of think when they hear this, that this is uh, for banks, right? That, and this really is going to be the most impacted, impacted for the banking institutions uh, and kind of more like their, the models that they've used in the past. But for others, it's going to be really uh, impactful because it's going to change the way that you have to look at your um, your credit losses. You can't use those uh, legacy methods that you've used in the past necessarily. All right. For non-banks, if you're preparing to adopt the standards, what do you need to focus on? You need to focus on identifying which financial instruments you have, uh, and then two, evaluate whether they need to make changes to existing credit impairment models to comply with the new standards. So things to be thinking about as you're closing your books for this year. Here's a little chart about, um, you know, how, how that looks for most companies. So existing U.S. GAAP, assets that are identified for individual evaluation, think about accounts receivable, so on and so forth. Those all get um, transitioned to this new credit model. Large groups of smaller balance, homogenous loans, more for banking institutions, uh, are also subject to the credit model. Assets acquired whose credit quality has deteriorated, also subject to the new model. What isn't is debt securities that are available for sale and beneficial interest in securitized assets, uh, mostly not going to be applicable. So just expect that this credit model is going to apply to you going forward. Okay. So they have this concept of expected losses versus incurred losses. So the legacy gap is incurred losses, then you book it. The current new gap is going to be expected losses. So um, what does that mean? Uh, the CECL model does not specify a threshold for recognizing an impairment allowance. Rather, an entity will recognize its estimate of expected credit losses for financial assets as of the end of the reporting period. Credit impairment will be recognized as an allowance or a contra asset, think uh, a reserve account, uh, rather than as a direct write down of the amortized cost basis of a financial asset. So the reserve method is going to really apply to this. Recognition of changes in estimates. At each reporting period, a, a reporting entity should update its estimate and adjust the allowance for credit losses accordingly. Increases in the allowance are recorded through net income as a credit loss expense. Decreases in the allowance are recorded through net income as a reversal of credit loss expense. So not an income or a gain item, just a reversal of an expense item. All right. The concept of lifetime losses. Uh, um, Really, the, the point is to look to the end horizon of that asset's life and predict what you estimate is going to be the realized value. That's not, you know, let's partially reserve it this year and then based on what happens, we'll partially reserve the rest next year. Um, really, you have to look at the lifetime of the asset. Okay. So you must consider all available and relevant data when it comes to ex, uh, estimating expected credit losses, including past events, current conditions, and reasonable and supportable forecasts. Historical write-off experience is a reference point for determining expected losses, but should consider conditions that may differ from current expectations and accordingly revise its estimate of credit losses. So, for example, um, let's say, you know, Another Ukraine type of war started um, that had a significant, meaningful impact on the global economy or the domestic economy. Um, you might say, take that event currently and say, you know, that's analogizes to COVID or to some other similar event. 
And based on, you know, our experience from that event, we expect the following going forward, right? So you can take that condition, current condition or event to predict what you think is going to happen in the future. It's not purely based on, you know, what has happened in the last 12 months or 24 months and using only the historical. So you can use judgment and current events and conditions under the current credit loss model to predict going forward. But the caveat is you you have to have, um, here's uh, how they stated here, is it reasonable and supportable um, facts, right? It can't just be purely judgment. So you really got to build the case. You got to collect the data. And then that data has to support your um, forecast of what you, you expect is going to happen. In the absence of, of firm data, you have to use the historical uh, experience. That's what the, the standard is saying. It's saying, if you can build the case, you can use that. But if you, it's not going to be based on judgment. You can't just say management. Um, we expect we're going to incur more losses this year than in the past because of the following. Um, it has to be supported by more than just purely judgment. It has to really be driven by data. Um, that can be presented and supported. So it really is going to depend on how well you can predict the future. Um, you know, how good is your business at doing that? How much data can you, can you collect? You know, for an institution like a bank, where you get customer applications that include, you know, their demographic data, their age, their gender, their income level, all that stuff, right? And you can compile a huge data set and and model that, you're going to be able to leverage that aspect of the CECL model more. That's why they talk about this being really brought uh, very applicable to banks. If you don't really have all that much information, you can't do as much with it. So your ability to utilize that forecast element to the standard is really going to be contingent on what data you have to present that. So if you've got like DNB reports for new customers um, and you update those regularly, like you may be able to compile some data there to support your argument. In the absence of, of that kind of data, you may just have to defer to that historical um, experience. There's no method that's required. Some of the methods that can be used are the DCF model, um, loss rate method, roll rate method, probability of default method, aging schedule, your typical AR aged bucket type analysis. Um, so I'll let you guys read into that uh, based on what applies to your business. As far as the standard, what's on the horizon? Um, there's a new ASU 2202, which eliminates the accounting guidance on troubled debt restructurings for creditors and amends the guidance on vintage disclosures. Uh, not applicable to most businesses, but it's going to be out there. And then the ASU would broaden the population of financial assets also that are within the scope. So there will be a little bit more clarity in the future about which um, financial assets are subject to this credit model requirement. All right, so that that's Cecil. Um, before we continue, does anybody have any questions on Cecil? I know that, that was a lot to cover in a short period of time. Can I ask on um, that, um, does Cecil address anything related to, like it seems like some of the collectability is kind of more binary as far as, yes, we're gonna collect it, no, we're not, you need to make an estimate for that. But does it take the time value of like, hey, we might have a receivable that we currently have as like, yes, this is valid, we're going to receive it, but maybe the reality is we won't receive it for two years do you discount the current receivable to account for that? No, not unless the the term is beyond. If it's a two-year term, five-year term, like a note, uh, yes. If it just so happens that it's going to take a long time to collect and um, it's on current terms, then that does not get um, factored in. But I think really the idea is more of uh, modeling, right? Because if you think about your accounts receivable, I have clients, a construction-based uh, client, they they sell ground remediation products. And so in the construction in, industry, as some of you know, um, 
it can take a, a while for the payment cycle to flow through from um, the company that's paying for the construction to the general contractor, to the subcontractor, to the supplier, right? So for accounts receivable in that industry, they can really drag out. And so we have to very carefully evaluate them. And under the historical gap, you could make the argument of, you know, our, our sales manager has been in touch. We have a commitment from the owner, like they're just waiting on something to be monetized, right? Like making a business case to support the net realizable value. That judgment business case, you know, type analysis is is no longer um, technically within gap. I'm sure businesses will continue to do that, but it's more um, historical data, right? Like that company or client of yours plus others like them that have similar maybe it's a similar size business uh similar credit rating um similar industry or, or product um and you have to say what does the data show for that the data shows maybe that uh 25 percent chance it's not going to be collected based on you know five customers that fit into that category right so it's more um like a modeling analysis type evaluation uh, driven by the historical um, transactions and less about, you know, business case, making a business case for why a customer is going to pay, uh, pay you back, you know. Hopefully that that clarifies a little bit. Thank you. You're welcome. This may be a bit of a naive question, but who actually holds management or the external accounting firm accountable for the way they calculate um, however they model these things. I mean, is it ultimately, yeah, we expect over the next uh, over the next year losses, well, not losses, but you, just, you set up an allowance like banks do. I mean, banks have always set up allowances for many years out on their loans and so on. Mm -hmm. But they always play with these allowances. And if if the economy does better, they recapture the, the reserves and so on. Is it simply reflected in the stock price if you don't hit your... Um, your forecasted earnings you get docked in the stock market is that the ultimate accountability or is there somebody at some regulator who's actually looking at the way you calculate things yeah there's a couple of different pieces of that so i mean for companies that have audited financial statements right the public companies that we audit we have the pcaob which is uh, the sec's counterpart that regulates us uh, every one to three years and it's an extremely excruciatingly painful process. And um, so in those cases, there has to be a lot of data and a lot of forecasting. And uh, to your point, that's one of the, the troubles with a lot of the convergence of the standards, even ASC 606, Revenue, CECL now. Um, if, when one of the slides that I covered, it talked about that reserve can go up and down, right? And it can kind of bounce around. So as auditors, yeah, that's a huge risk for us because companies want to manage earnings, right? You want to sandbag a bad year. You want to uh, beef up a, a year to make budget or um, bonuses. So it can be really difficult. So obviously, it's going to be a risk-based kind of uh, process for the auditor to decide how robust and um, supportable that evidence is. Um and then for private companies, we have peer um, peer reviewers and other comparable size accounting firm that will inspect our work papers to make sure that we're getting that data. So um, that's that's essentially it. But the, again, the, on the if regulatory can, side, I... we have we have inspectors, and then on the gap side, it's more of just a risk based judgment. If it, it does it feel like it's an earnings manipulation, it's bouncing up and down conveniently, and we're going to look and scrutinize that supportability of that modeling more and if it's really this is a good year you know and that adjustment doesn't really have a significant material impact on on the financials you're probably going to require less data and support and if i can add um it goes back about 25 years for me i worked at uh, bank boston fleet boston so expected losses on small business banking portfolios modeled by the treasury you're looking at data but you also have the regulators such as the OCC the Federal Reserve state and other regulators coming in to look at how the banks are managing this so you know they can they have some impact on that whole process too absolutely but on the financial for private companies side, much more regular for financial institutions yeah. yes. but yeah. if it's a private company it's 
you know, different. Totally agree. Yep. So it's just uh, where the, the accounting standards have gone with much more judgment um, based approach and not a rules based approach, which, you know, the U.S. accounting standards became a rules based approach because, you know, of earnings manipulation and people taking advantage of things. Right. So we'll see if, if there's eventually more standards that are implemented that get us back to where we were. But uh, for right now, we're we're left with that. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Excellent. Okay. Can you all still see my screen? Sorry. Not seeing it right now. Okay. Let me try this again. That's better. There we go. So just one last tidbit for me. Um, I always think this is an interesting one again for you guys. Just um, what are the common restatement categories every year? There's the accounting today and audit analytics that kind of cover what are the restatement areas that uh, occur each year. So number one, the restatement area was debt equity classification. A lot of warrants, a lot of companies taking out private equity type debt that have warrants attached. Those are typically classified as liabilities, but um, there's a lot of games or, you know, uh, creative methods to try to get that as equity presentation. And then SPACs in the public company space, there was a huge restatement um, trend for that. Second being revenue recognition, third liability recognition, fourth expense recognition, and fifth stock-based comp. So, you know, just keep an eye out for these areas if, if they're applicable to your business. With that, I'll let Lori Hess, my colleague on the tax side, take it over with a tax update. All right. Thank you, guys. And, and Andrew, you're okay to keep running the slides? Okay. All right. So, as Andrew mentioned, not too many... Uh, big changes on the tax side. Um, the first, if you want to go to the next slide that we'll go over is asset depreciation. So every year, the section 179 um, amount is able to be deducted in a current year is raised for inflation. And this year that uh, limit for 2023, um, for the 2023 tax year is 1,160,000. Um, that amount starts to get reduced if you have um, asset additions in excess of 2,890,000. Um, also worth noting for 179, that the maximum deduction for a sports utility vehicle in 2023 is gonna be $28,900. Um, the larger change here is that after many years of being able to uh, have 100% bonus depreciation on fixed assets, um, a deferred part of the Tax Cuts and Job um, Act tax bill was that bonus depreciation is phasing out starting with the 2023 tax year. So bonus depreciation is only 80%. For 2023, it goes down to 60% in 2024, 40% in 2025, and you know keeps decreasing until it's zero in 2027. So those are quick updates on um, depreciation. Andrew, can you go to the next slide? Um, the next thing I wanted to mention, which, you know, this isn't a new thing, but um, it is a, a, this is, you know, one of the IRS's top, top items this year and at the end of last year is um, employee retention credit audits. So I'm sure um, everyone in the group out here is familiar with, there was lots of credit mills that were out there calling, you know, every company that existed and saying that they qualified for ERC and getting lots of people to file ERC claims. The problem is that everyone really didn't qualify for ERC and um, there's a lot of fraud that the IRS knows is um, happened to this area. So they are digging to this a lot um, with audits. And they've also, um, this, these bullet points here go over, um, in September of 2023, they placed a moratorium on processing any new claims that were filed at least through the end of 2023, but that has not opened up yet. So, you know, they stopped and anyone who's filing an I, uh, ERC claim isn't gonna get processed. 
that's supposed to open up in the future if there are, you know, valid claims out there that have an expired statute of limitations. But um, currently, no, no ERC claims are being processed. The IRS um, is working with the Justice Department to address the fraud with the promoters, in addition to, you know, auditing claims that they feel are invalid. Um, the IRS has also put together programs for people to withdraw claims. Um, so if, you know, a, a ERC credit mill, you know, contacted you, told you you qualified, maybe it wasn't, you know, they didn't give you the, the right story and you you filed a fraudulent claim, there's now a path through the IRS that you could withdraw those fraudulent claims um, and either return refunds if they've been received or, you know, just not get them processed. Um, you know, our, our recommendation is that, you know, taxpayers that have worked with a credit mill, um, and filed the claim on aggressive grounds, which generally was under the suspension method and not supported by a decrease in gross receipts, should consider um, participating in these um, IRS withdrawal or repayment programs to um, avoid you know, penalties and interest and other problems um, that can come from having filed an incorrect claim. We do have a great ERC team based in Washington, DC. Uh, they're really on the front leading edge of this stuff. So if you're one of these, you know, that that has an application and you may be worried about the status of that application or maybe if you got yourself in some trouble, feel free to reach out to us. We can connect you with with one of our specialists and they can help you out. Yes, I've done that with clients where we didn't file their ERC claims, but they had, had this happened and our, our team has um, processed the withdrawals for them already. So just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. Next slide. Andrew, can you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this isn't really a tax arena, but it's similar to um, the foreign bank account reporting FBARS um, that's new this year. So I don't know if everybody out there is familiar with FinCEN. It's the government website. It's totally separate from the IRS, but that is where you report um, your foreign bank accounts that are you know $10,000 or excess for a year. They've added a new requirement, which is the Corporate Transparency Act Beneficial Ownership Reporting, which is effective 1124 that all entities with certain exceptions um, registered to do business in the United States must submit a beneficial ownership information report with FinCEN. So it would be similar to where you would report the FBAR. And um, that report requires to provide um, details on ownership if there's a 25% or more owner or controller, as well as any changes in ownership going forward. Entities that were in existence prior to 1124 don't need to report. The due date for that first report is 1125, so you have a full year to get that done. But any entities that are formed after 1124 have 90 days to um, report uh, that formation with um, FinCEN. There are 23 types of entities that are exempt from reporting. The most common exception is large corporations defined as entities with more than 20 full-time employees, more than 5 million in gross revenue, and an operating facility in the U.S. Other exempt entities would include um, entities that are already subject to ownership reporting, which is SEC companies, publicly traded companies, banks, insurance companies, financial institutions. So just wanted to get everybody up. Uh, heads up that that, you know, if you have um, any entities that fall into this, you need to make sure you're reporting um, that with FinCEN. Next slide. So last year, um, somebody one, that oh, had sorry. A question? sorry. Sorry. I heard uh, that it passed the House, but it has not passed the Senate yet. Do you agree with that? The... Did you hear that? I It was very quiet. I, I had trouble hearing it, but I think he said it hasn't passed sorry. the Senate yet. Yeah, I probably need to put my headset on. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I heard it passed the House, but not Senate. So it's not official yet. Just curious if you've heard that. I have not heard that. I could okay. double check and see what I see, but I thought that it was. I don't think. Yeah, I don't know who, uh, to tell you the truth, is the board that created this rule, but um, I thought it was. This is, is it's it's a rule. Yeah. Okay. No. No. Pro no problem. I'm just curious. Yeah. I just I was doing my. I found out about this yesterday. And I was doing some homework on it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll likewise double check. But um, yeah, I know from 
from the guidance we've received that it's it needs to be done. Okay. Thanks. I think for we're going to plan on sending our tax letter to all that we sent to all of our clients to this group for your use. So maybe we can uh, just confirm that when we send. Yeah, it's the in there. That's why I think it's I think it's for sure done because I don't think they would have put it out in the tax letter if it wasn't a for sure thing. Um, but I will I will check that. Thank you. Um, so last year in 2022, uh, one of the delayed um, parts of the Tax Cuts and Job Act that is a revenue, uh, making revenue for the IRS was um, Section 174, which required the capitalization of research and experimental expenditures. Um, those have to be capitalized and amortized over five years if it's US-based research and 15 years if it's foreign-based research. Um, Unfortunately, when this came out last year, you know, everyone kept thinking that it was going to get repealed, which it never ended up getting repealed in the full year. It still hasn't. I, I know there's probably still hopes for that. Um, but there was no guidance that was really out from the IRS um, on this particular part of the code, the tax code. And um, in August, a notice came out that um, does offer some guidance. Um, so some notable highlights include exclusion of certain GNA expenses, guidance on capitalization of software development costs, clarifications of right and risks, test for contract research. Um, and there are supposed to be um, regulations coming out from the IRS, but those still haven't um, been issued. And they could obviously change this notice, but the notice is kind of gives us an insight as to what the IRS is thinking for enforcement with 174. So if this is the area that you um, are affected by, you might want to uh, take a look at that or talk about that with your tax advisor. Um, next slide, please. Another new thing for this year is um, excise tax on stock buybacks. So there's a new 1% excise tax imposed on the fair market value of any corporate stock that is repurchased by a cover corporation during the year. And this is applicable to any repurchases made after December 31st, 2022. So this would have to be reported on your 2023 tax returns. Um, so a covered corporation. applicable to private companies as well? Like if you yeah, have so a RSU we'll plan this. for a private company and you do repurchases, would that apply? Yeah. Well, if you're, if you're a covered corporation, which we'll go over right here, then okay. you yeah. qualify. You have to do it. So um a cover corporation is a U.S. corporation whose stock is traded on established securities market. So I guess that's not lots of private ones would not be in there. Um, repurchased by a cover corporations, um, repurchases by a, a specified affiliate may also be subject um, to the tax if the affiliate is owned by 50% uh, or more by a purchasing corporation or a partnership that's more than 50% of the capital profits or interest held by the purchasing corporation. Um, special rules apply to um, foreign affiliates as well. Um, next slide. So just quickly, a repurchase is a redemption um, or any other transaction determined to be economically similar to redemption by the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, so essentially, it's this um, this. 1%, I mean, it's not huge, but 1% excise tax. It depends on the, the level of your transaction. It, it could be a lot of money. Um, but uh, the definition of repurchase for purposes of this provision can be applied very broadly and may even apply to mergers and acquisitions and liquidations if cash consideration is received. Um, to know for sure how that's going to play out, we'll have to wait and see what guidance the IRS issues in this area. Again, this is one of those things that's new this year, and there's not uh, lots of guidance out on it yet. Next slide. Um, so the 1% tax base imposed is reduced by the fair market value of any stock issued by the corporation during the taxable year, including stock issued to employees of the corporation or its affiliates, whether or not the stock is used or provided in response to exercise of a stock option. Um, it does not, the excise tax does not apply to a Section 338 reorg, which has no gain or loss recognized. Um, in instances where the stock is repurchased or an amount of the stock equal to the value of the stock repurchased is contributed to an employer-sponsored retirement plan or employee stock ownership plan or similar plan, it doesn't apply in any case when the total value of the stock repurchased during the taxable year does not exceed $1 million. Um, it doesn't apply to repurchases by security dealers in the ordinary course of business. 
three purchases by regulated investment companies or real estate investment trusts. And it does not reply if the repurchase is treated as a dividend. Um, the tax, this 1% tax is not deductible. So that's just a side note there. Um, this next slide quickly is another new thing that takes effect in 2023, but only applicable virus is um, estimating to about 20, 200 multinational large companies. So essentially, if a company has a three-year average annual adjustment financial statement income of a billion uh, or more, there is a 15% alternative minimum corporate tax that is going to be imposed. Um, mm. So that's that's a hefty tax, but probably not applicable to anyone on the call, uh, but just out there um, so that you guys know. Um, and then what is our time? You know, I guess we're a little over. I'll just mention really quick here, and you could look through the rest of these slides. Um, there was a court case that came out in um, 2022 that was finally decided about um, an S corporation in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. They had about 90 employees. Um, they, between 2004 and 2008, the taxpayers that own this um, S corp did not receive any salary or wages from the business. And they took along with their three adult children, a lot of, um, they used, the, use corporate credit cards for a lot of their personal business or their personal expenditures. Um, you know, essentially using the S corporation as a bank for, you know, whatever they wanted to buy kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And um, essentially this kind of, this case did not, you know, get decided in the taxpayer's favor. And the thought is that the IRS is going to be looking close, more closely going forward at reasonable compensation for, um, employee owners of closely held and S corporations. And also, you know, if, if, you know, distributions are, should be reclassed as wages or as dividends. Um, so that's just something to keep on your radar. Um, I will stop at that. I know there's a bunch of slides on the same thing. So, so I will skip that. But Again, as Andrew mentioned, we're going to send out to you the uh, Baker Tilly tax letter, which goes over a bunch of things in more detail. So if you have more questions on any of these things, you could definitely reach out to us. But that letter should help give you a little bit more guidance on some of these uh, issues. All, All right. right. Andrew, Lori, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else have any questions before we uh, move on? No? Okay. Well, appreciate the opportunity to connect with you guys. Um, Laura and I, Lori and I are more than happy to take any questions uh, separately. Um, would be more than happy to talk about whether Baker Chili can be of service to you and, and the companies that you manage. Um, you know, Don and some others are, are great clients of ours. We, we uh, value our clients greatly and would appreciate any opportunities you could send our way. It was good talking to you. Happy New Year and look forward to hopefully connecting with you all again soon.